all right. I mean, it would be as, you know, approaching him to do something like this would be as Aiden in a chat room. It seems very unlikely. Um, but I sent him a copy of my book, and he immediately uh, uh, came back and said, yeah, sure, I love it, and wrote a blurb for it. And then a few months later sent me another email saying, listen, we're going to be running a, a meeting in Florida, a skeptic conference. Why don't you come down and give a talk? And I said, uh, all right, sure. And I wound up giving a talk there. And uh, Randy and I became friends. And um, I've been speaking at every conference since. And then last year, he asked me to be president of his Educational Foundation, which is a nonprofit, uh, to promote critical thinking and skeptical thinking across the world. And I was blown away by this. I mean, it's it's one thing to have a sort of an informal relationship and all that sort of thing. Sure. But then to be asked to run it, you know, it was pretty uh, pretty stunning. And he, he did this because he wants to take more time to write books. He's writing two books right now. Yeah. They're going very well. And in the meantime, uh, I wouldn't say I'm running the foundation. That's not really true. I mean, it's a Randy's baby. But I'm sort of, I've got my hand on the steering wheel and together to try to do the best job we can to yeah. uh, teach people how to think rationally. Well, I, I, I've got uh, two questions for you before I hand you over to the audience, so to speak. Um, just firstly, when, um, the, I, I always think that the use of the term skeptic is um, somewhat negative, and it doesn't actually um, do what I would refer, much prefer to refer to as free thinkers any credit by using skeptic. Um, it, because of the, even though a dictionary definition may uh, be actually perfectly accurate as to what you're describing, it does have negative connotations. Do you think that, that the use of the word sceptic does have that effect on people? Refresh your page, I think. No sound. Yeah, if you just refresh your Yeah, if you just refresh your page that should do it. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's probably done it. Anybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. Take a few okay, seconds. they say I'm bad. Yeah, All right, go. good. Um so the idea of, of using the word skeptic. You know, the skeptic, the, the word has a meaning, and it means basically someone who doesn't just accept something on blind faith, that if you make a claim, you know, I'm going to say, listen, I want evidence for your claim, show me what you got, and then I examine it critically. You know, just because you have evidence doesn't mean you're right. Uh, people have evidence of flying saucers. I'll, I'll go back to that example. Uh, but it's, you know, fuzzy pictures and crappy video and eyewitness reports, which are typically wrong. And so, you know, if you... You come in and say, here's my evidence. You know, my being a skeptic doesn't mean just saying, give me the evidence. I want to examine. I want to look at it. I want to draw my own conclusions. It's okay to look at earlier things and say, you know what? Um, I, don't, I can't explain exactly what you've got here, but I've seen things just like it that have proven to be other things. That's okay. That's being a skeptic. Uh, you can call it free thinking. You can call it critical thinking. You can call it rationalism. You can call it reason. There's a million names for it. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, they tried to change the name to Bright, which I hated. As soon as oh, somebody yeah. said, we're going to call ourselves really Bright, bad. and I said, that is the worst public relations idea ever. Because yeah. as soon as you say it, first of all, it's, it's a kind of a twee word. Second of all, if you're not Bright, you're clearly dim, which means you're just by picking that name, you're automatically insulting anybody who doesn't uh, yeah. your name. <laughs> anyway, it was just a bad idea. So, you know, yeah. people want to think that skeptics are cynics, that you come to me and you say, you know, I saw this thing and I can't explain it, and then I say, you're an idiot. That's clearly, you know, swamp gas or Venus or something like that. That's, that's being a jerk. That's not being a skeptic. Um, it's being yeah. a cynic. It's, it's just denying stuff. Skeptics don't necessarily just deny stuff. Now, there, look, you know, if you come to me and say, I have evidence of Bigfoot, it's not that bad for me to say, yeah, I don't think so, simply because we have seen this a thousand times before. 
We've seen all sorts of hoaxes. We've seen all sorts of evidence that's not panned out. There's no scientific reason to think that there's a Bigfoot out there. And there's plenty of evidence to say, no, there is no Bigfoot out there. So, you know, it's, it's okay to say, you know, the, the, the place I'm coming from here is to say, I don't think you're right. However, if your evidence is compelling, that's, you know, that's got to sway me. And, and the thing that makes me nuts is when people say, oh, you scientists have a closed mind. You, you don't believe in anything uh, new. And it's like, yeah. you, you've got it exactly backwards. I'm the one with the open mind. That's how science works. Yeah. Astronomers discovered that the universe, it, we, we've known the universe is expanding for a century. We've just learned that that expansion is accelerating. That is completely the opposite of what we were expecting. We thought it would be slowing down, but it turns out, no, it's expanding faster every day. And that is uh, a shock to everybody. And, and the scientists at first said, yeah, you better have really good evidence. The astronomers presented their evidence. The other astronomers looked at it and said, it could be, you know, any one of these 20 things to explain your data. And one by one, those things were checked off the list and shown to be, uh, yeah, that's not and eventually, basically, the only thing that was left was the expansions accelerating. That's so something, that, that's something that's puzzled me. Um, um, uh, is it possible for you to explain to, to imagine, imagine you're talking to a pretty simple person who's got a understand our science? Um, is it possible to explain that, um, how how that um, how it is that the acceleration is increasing? Well, there's an acceleration of the expansion because it, right. it, it does go completely contrary to what you'd imagine. I mean, it, it must in some way sort of be overcoming the gravitational attraction that That's right. is supposed to be supposed bringing, to be bringing up. everything back together again. Um, are, are, are you able to explain to a simple like thing like me uh, what's going on there? Well, no. <laughs> no, it, no, the problem is, as soon as you're talking about... That is the best answer. Yeah, there you go. Um, so next 24 question. hours, um, yeah. that will be the next, the, that will the, be the best answer ever. No, the real problem here is that as soon as you're talking about, as soon as you start talking about... Yeah. It's really, it really is complicated. The uh, best way to describe it is using the math and the physics. We're, we're sort of half-evolved apes. We, we just recently came down out of the trees, and, and our whole experience, our, our brains are evolved to only understand things uh, that happen within a couple of miles of us and moving at slow speeds. And when you're talking about billions of light years and the speed of light, our brains kind of go, yeah, right. So, in fact, this stuff is complicated, and the only way you can describe it is by analogy, and those analogies ultimately fail. So, you know, I always have to say, listen, here's an analogy. Don't, don't try to take this too much to heart because as soon as you do, it's going to get worse. But you can kind of picture the universe as being um, a balloon. And this, this is a terrible analogy because it, it makes people think that the universe is expanding into something, and it really is. But if you can imagine that you're a very tiny bacterium and you're living on the surface of a balloon, um, you, that balloon, is two-dimensional. You can move left and right. You can move up and down. But you can't move in and out. There is no off the surface or beneath the surface. To you, that's just alien. So you can move anywhere over the surface of the balloon. Now, if I'm outside this balloon and blowing into it, that balloon is expanding. So if you were to, if you were to sort of make a map of that whole balloon and walk around, you, you could probably figure out that the balloon is expanding. If you were to observe something far away on that balloon, you might be able to tell that thing is moving away from you. And then all things on the balloon appear to be moving away from you. And you can say, maybe they're not really moving away. Maybe they're just sitting there, but the balloon itself is expanding. And that's kind of what's going on here with the universe. Well, I, I, well I, I, if, if, if I sure. may, my, my, my trouble with the balloon analogy is that um, it implies that everything effectively is going to be on the surface of the balloon expanding away and leaving an empty space in the middle. But that isn't the case, is it? There is no empty space in the middle that's, uh, I'm, uh, sorry, am I making sense? I'm, probably, I'm, probably no uh, less than I am at this point, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but do you, it, I mean, the, the, the idea of um, a balloon being inflated means that every, all the matter would be on the edge of the, effectively on the edge of the... Universe. Oh, I see. Well, that's... Uh, the, with, uh, with, an, with an empty hole in the middle. Right. Um, but 
Yeah, so it, it, that's why I'm the, saying... The universe, the universe doesn't have an empty middle. That's the point I'm seeing. Well, that's, that's the problem, is that it's, it's an analogy. And so if you, if you reduce yeah. our three-dimensional universe to two dimensions, so that it feels like you're living on the surface of a balloon, then the analogy is okay. But as soon as you say, but we're in a three-dimensional universe, are we expanding in four dimensions? You know, is there is there a center someplace that we're moving away from, like the ant is or the bacterium on the surface of the balloon? And the answer is no. Um, if, if you really are a two-dimensional creature living on the surface of a balloon, the center of that balloon is not on the balloon. It's inside the balloon in a different dimension. So, you know, these, these analogies, like I said, you can't take these analogies too much to heart because they get confusing. It's just an idea to sort of give you a, a place to start.